Man, I tell you, it, school's out. Vacation Bible School is already next week, which, man, it's like one thing ends and the gun goes off for the next one. So um, we're, we're looking forward to a great summer around here, and, and uh, I hope that you're praying about it, that uh, God's going to do great things. Uh, I want to ask that if you have served in the military or you had a parent or spouse or a child serving in the military or served in the military, I want you just to stand right quick. I want to I want to take a moment to pray. Yeah, appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you very much. I, I, I wanted to, you, you remain standing. Uh, I'm going to pray, and this is the direction I want to pray today. You know, we look at our current culture in our country, and uh, we get concerned uh, as followers of Jesus. We, uh, you know, we, we're so grateful for people that have given their lives for freedom, and a lot of our struggles um, uh, we think are abusing freedom. And so we, we want to be, as followers of Jesus, we want to be praying. I, I just believe God's not through with us as a nation. You know, when you read the scriptures, we see how uh, when they turned their back on the Lord, he allowed an enemy to come take over or whatever, and there was a time of brokenness and repentance. I want to get to that part of brokenness and repentance before uh, an enemy has to come and, and we submit in that particular area. So I want you to join me in prayer um, and uh, thank you for you that have served or had a parent or a child that served. So grateful. Father, we bow before you. Lord, we confess that the United States has been a great nation, but Lord, we have to open our eyes and confess that in many ways we've turned our back on you. And Lord, teach us how to repent. Teach us how to walk in, in submission to you and brokenness. And Father, see you in what you can do uh, in a nation. Father, I, I don't believe that you're through with the United States. So, Father, I'm asking, with all that's in me, Father, just come and do a mighty work. Lord, we uh, place our leadership in your hands. We place our armed services in your hands. Um, Lord, we just desire you. And uh, so, Lord, overcome our lack of belief, I, pl I pray. And, Father, I thank you for these that are standing, either they're representing a, a parent or a child or they serve themselves. And Lord, I'm just grateful for men and women that are willing to sacrifice for the sake of these freedoms we have. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, appreciate very much. I know that uh, Memorial Day is the kickoff of of summer, right? We kind of look at it that way. But we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper in just a moment, and uh, I, want to, I want to take some time to prepare our hearts. Uh, I, I, we, we're walking through a little letter called Philippians, and if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2 or get it on your device, you can do that. We've been walking through this, and it, just so that you know uh, the background, Paul is writing this from jail. It's not like he's sitting on a beach uh, writing a letter or he's not in his office writing a letter. Uh, he is in jail. He's under house arrest in Rome and the church in Philippi, who, which he started, sends a, many think he was the pastor there, his name is Epaphroditus, and they send him to Rome to take supplies to Paul because you see, if you were a Roman prisoner, Rome was not going to fix you meals and take care of you. They expected family or, or friends to come and give you your meal. That's the way things have changed. And that, so they needed, he needed to be taken care of. So the church sends Epaphroditus down there to uh, take care of him. 
And you're, you're going to understand that when we read this passage, Epaphroditus gets sick somehow. We don't know what he, what he had. He was literally on death's door. The word means he was staring death in the face. And uh, yet he, he, came, he came through. So let's read beginning in verse 25 of, of Philippians chapter 2. It's on the screen uh, if you don't have a device. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the sake of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service. I, li I like that, risking his life to come and to give what was lacking in your service. That risking in his life, his risking his life, actually was putting his life on the line for the sake of the gospel. You know, I I think uh, this is just a, a one off as I read that. I think we're looking for a generation of young men and young women who are looking for something to give their life for. And I think I think so often, and I'm guilty too of taking. The, the incredible life of following Jesus and turning it into a spectator sport. When it was something to give your life for, as Epaphroditus did. And we need to put this in front of this uh, generation. Stephen Ambrose wrote a book called Band of Brothers, which turned into a, a mini-series that many of you may uh, watch or you read the book. And the Band of Brothers takes the 101st Airborne it takes them, uh, Easy Company, it takes them from landing on uh, D-Day, landing, parachuting in behind lines, and then takes them from that point all the way to Eagle's Nest, which Adolf Hitler, uh, you know, had used in his final days, and, and they came, and, and uh, it takes them through that whole journey. It takes them through uh, the basic training when they're having to train, and then goes through all these things. They lost many of their uh, comrades or lost many of their brothers. Uh, but they, they, they build this incredible trust. And, and uh, you that are in the military or have been in the military, you're, you've been looking for that ever since you got out. Uh, I remember Chuck Swindoll saying one time, because he was in the Marines, when he got out of the Marines, he became a Christian and started going to church. He said, I wish the church was more like the Marines. In other words, he that band of brothers that was there. I want you to hold on to that picture just a moment because there's a couple of things I want to highlight in this scripture. I'm going to be brief today so we can get to the Lord's table. But there's two things that I want you to grab out of this passage today. The first one is this, and you can write this down. You are not bound by your past. You are not bound by your past. And, and here's why I say that. Epaphroditus literally means devoted to Aphrodite. That's what his name means. And who was Aphrodite? Well, she was a goddess, a deity that they worshipped. Most of the Roman towns had a temple in the middle of that they did pagan sacrifices. Many of them were very sensual in the way they, they did it. And that was to Aphrodite. She was the goddess of love and charm and, and these kind of things. But it was very sensual in how they, they worshipped. And here this guy is. His name's Aphroditus, which basically says, you're devoted to Aphrodite. So his parents probably uh, just named him because that may have been a common name, but he was devoted to Aphrodite. Well, somewhere along the line, he came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, and his life was radically changed, radically changed to the point of he's willing to risk his life for the sake of the gospel. You know, with the name uh, uh, that he, Epaphroditus that he had, he could have just lived in there and say, oh, woe is me, look at my name. 
And I see many followers of Jesus today who have had failure in their life, or you still remember somebody saying you were lazy as a child, or they said uh, you, were, you were an accident, or they said uh, something about, man, that's our wild child, that's our crazy child, or something like that. And you heard that, and that was spoken into your life, so you've hung on to it, and you've just said, that's who I am. That, that's what i got to do. Or some of you had some failure in your life. There was a divorce, or there was an abortion, or there, there was an addiction to alcohol or, or drugs, or maybe there's a, a jail sentence that you had to, to do. I don't know what it may have been. And you've had that failure, and you're thinking, i got to live with this, and because people won't let you get away with it, right? So who's to, who's to say that God is going to set me free? From this, I want you to know that when you come to Christ, you become a new creation in Jesus Christ. What happens is, is that you know, you're now forgiven. You are loved. You are redeemed. You are a child of God. This is who you are. Your identity changes. So what I want you to grab, point one, is this. You are not bound by your past. Some of you need to look in the mirror this afternoon and you need to tell yourself, I am not bound by my past. I may have screwed up in my past. I may have had a failure in my past. But I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ has made me new. And one of the reasons we come to the table and we take a moment like this is because we need to come and keep short accounts. Short accounts of broken relationships. Short accounts of uh, getting our feet dirty, so to speak. Still sin issues that we deal with. And we deal with them on a daily basis. So we want to come and say, okay, Lord, I, want, I need to deal with these before I come to the table. Because what does your mom tell you before you go to the table? Have you washed your hands? We're, we're washing our hands today. So number one is you're not bound to your past. Number two is this. You need a brother or sister. You need a brother or sister. Here, here's why... Uh, here's, Here's why I say that. Notice what uh, Paul said here about Epaphroditus. He uh, talks about him as a, uh, as a fellow worker, his brother, his fellow soldier. He is his brother. Literally, that means came from the same womb is the, what the term means. We say in our day, what? You're a brother from another mother. That's what we say in our uh, culture today. And... And he, there's his brotherhood. And some of you grew up in a time when you addressed others at church as brother so-and-so, brother Mark, uh, sister Pam. You, you may have come up in that time. And it was a, a neat time, but you just don't, you don't see that anymore. And, uh, but the reason for that is, is that not only are we born into the same family, but there's a brotherhood that needs to exist. And what I've discovered is that many people decide to walk in isolation, especially in our culture. I mean, I don't know how many of you were actually born, I mean, the adults who were born in this area, but it, there's a tendency when you move to an area, you don't build relationships. And now, working from home, everything uh, that COVID did to us, that isolation has been destructive. I mean... The suicide, you know, situation has gone crazy. And, and because of this isolation, we need brothers and you ladies need sisters. And it, brothers, it doesn't need to be your wife. Yes, there's accountability to your wife, which should be overboard. But you need somebody else that's going to sharpen you in your life. Here's, here's five reasons that you need a brother or sister in your life. Number one is for encouragement. We are very, live in a very discouraged day. Uh, one thing you may not realize that we do as a church is every quarter in the year, we get together all the pastors in the area. Or, or they come together for a lunch. We have chosen uh, that central because of, uh, because of my calling in this area. There is budgeted funds to make sure we take care of the pastors in this area. And 
there has been a brotherhood. We had uh, the last one last Wednesday. We had about 50 guys and gals in, in, over at the children's home. If a bomb had hit right then, the spiritual leadership at that level would have been wiped out in a round run. But it's incredible the relationships that have been built. And I want to say thank you to you as a church that have this as a vision. And you may not even know that we do it. And you uh, help make it happen. And it's been a great thing. But the reason I say that is many of those guys are discouraged. They, they've gone through COVID. They've gone through uh, the uh, snow situation that happened. They've gone through the elections. They've gone through racial tensions. And they've had to make decisions. And their leadership uh, bandwidth has been stretched a me- a measurably thin. And they have fatigue. And they're discouraged. That is pastors. So you multiply that. If the spiritual leadership is that way, just think how everybody else is battling some discouragement. And so we need encouragement. We need brothers and sisters alongside of us that are going to encourage us. The second thing is courage. We need courage. Um, I think when, when uh, Epaphroditus showed up with Paul, remember we read at the beginning of this letter that that what happened is a whole praetorium guards were coming to Christ or hearing the gospel because of what's taking place. There's a courage that Paul had gotten. I think Epaphroditus helped encourage, and he brought courage with him. So we need courage. In a day when uh, we're tempted to be quiet, we need courage. Number three, protection. Protection. Uh, You know, if you read Stephen Ambrose's book, uh, Band of Brothers, or you saw the, the miniseries, you, you saw a group of men that completely trusted each other. They'd been through the fire together. They'd been through wars together. They had a common objective together, and they were moving that way. You need that in your life. You need a, a man. You need a brother. Ladies, you need a sister. Somebody who is going to protect your six, have your back, and going to be there for you. And, and here's the deal. We think, oh, I've got a lot of those. You really don't. I mean, if you can get one or two in life, man, you're blessed. And so you need that. Number four is this, accountability. Yes, husbands, you're accountable to your wife. Yes, wives, you're accountable to your husband. But you need another brother, men. You need a sister, ladies, that you can be accountable to, that are going to... Uh, keep you from wandering. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I, I'm, that's me. If I don't have accountability in my life, if I don't have brothers that are checking up on me, there's a tendency I'm going to drift into isolationism, and truly, when that happens, my flesh is going to take over. Uh, and, and we say, well, Paul said, walk according to the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Let's be honest in this room. We all battle the flesh. We battle it very hard. And we need other people to help keep us accountable. And that's where you need this brother or sister. And then fifthly is this. You need support. You need support. Those persons that are going to hold you up when uh, things get hard, they're going to hold you up when you're struggling with something, they're going to hold you up when uh, you get the pink slip in the mail or... Or you, uh, you get a sick, you get a bad report from your doctor. You need somebody that's going to hold you up and hold you together in the midst of what you're going through. And that's where Paul calls it by Epaphroditus, his brother. This is my brother. This, this sharing the same womb kind of experience. Do you have that person in your life? Uh, just think about it. I mean, do you really? We do not know who we have in our lives until the rug gets pulled out from under us. Who's going to be there when things get really hard? And, and that's where you need this brother or sister in your life. And that's what Paul is saying about Epaphroditus. And, and what I love is it goes on to say, verse 29, So receive him in the Lord with all joy, And honor such men. Honor. Honor these people. When was the last time you maybe 
have that brother or a couple of brothers, and they may be in, in your past a little bit, or you ladies, you have a sister, and you took the opportunity just to say thank you. Thank you for having my six. Thank you for being an encouragement to me. Thank you for not letting me wander. You need that person in your life. I guarantee you, I, I know that many people who used to be sitting right where you are drifted off because no one, they had no brother, had no sister. So, you're not bound to your past. So in a moment, when we come to the Lord's Supper, you, maybe some of you need to come to this altar and just lay your past and say, okay, God, I need, I need to know who I am in you. And then secondly, you need a brother or a sister. That's what Paul is getting across to us. Let me, let me end with a, a quick personal story. Pam and I are currently both driving rent cars. Never in 42 years of marriage have we been driving rent cars at the same time. And, and you may be thinking, well, that's, why are you doing that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Um, I, bought a, I bought a new car um, several months ago. Well, I guess a, a, it's been about a month and a half or something. I don't know. It's two months. Uh, let me put it this way. I drove it more with hail damage than I did without hail damage. What happened is on that Thursday when the hailstorm came in, you know, they said rain was coming and you see the clouds. Okay, rain's coming. That's not a big a deal. I was at the office. My office is on the third floor and I could look out on the parking lot and uh, man, it's starting to rain, get dark, and all of a sudden the hail started coming. And Jim Moorhead and I are up in my office and we're looking out there and we're bo watching both of our cars just get pummeled with the golf ball size hail that was coming. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's my car. And, uh, it, uh, I, I, and somebody can say, why don't you run down there and move it or something? I, I'd have gotten concussion. Yeah, it was that bad. It broke my windshield. It uh, did a lot of damage. And so it's in the shop. So I'm driving a rent car. Pam, uh, a couple of weeks ago, she was going to see her sisters in Waco. She was out on the toll road about 9 o'clock in the morning, had left the house, cruising along, and had her crew set at 80, going down the, the toll road out on 130, and a coyote literally ran a, out in front of her. I mean, 9 o'clock in the morning, coyotes are supposed to be out at night. And uh, she hit that thing right on the front bumper, and uh, didn't, the airbags did not go off, which, which is good. I've told this story before, and people say, well, what about the coyote? Uh, you can guess at 80 miles an hour, this is not about the coyote, though. <laughs> and so there's a lot of sensors and everything in your bumper, so her car's over at Caliber Collision, and so we're both driving uh, rent cars. And... Uh, I should tell them what happened during, <laughs> during Bible fellowship today, on it. <laughs> okay, th this is a one-off. Uh, no, but, but I, I got your attention now. Uh, now, these are rent cars. They're, they're not our real... Our, so, uh, after Bible fellowship, we'd walk out to Bible fellowships, and, and we're going to go get in the car... And uh, I, I went out to, my car is neon blue back there. You can't miss it. Uh, but she's driving a, uh, I better not say what it is because somebody's going to think. So uh, we're, well, she said, oh, I, I said, I forgot my keys. And she said, well, I got my keys. And I, I said, okay, so well, let's go get in there. And she, uh, she clicks it and, uh, and I get I walk over to it, and I get in the passenger side. She's got the keys. She's going to drive. And I look over. <laughs> I look over. She's gotten in the car beside us. <laughs> She's in the driver's. I don't want to say that, babe. So somebody's driving a silver Ford Kia, uh, a, a silver Kia out there. She got into the driver. You didn't lock your car, man. <laughs> 
So I'm sitting over there in the passenger of the car next to her. I'm thinking, what are you? And she's doing the same thing to me. Oh, shoot. Uh, okay, this was a good story. I just blew the spirit for the Lord's Supper. But, but I was driving the other day in my uh, rent car, and it's a nice little rent car. It, it you know, got all the accessories, Apple, Apple Play, and, and uh, so I, man, hands-free on everything. It's really nice. And as I'm, I'm, I'm driving, I have this thought come into my uh, heart. And, and I don't want to be mystical, mystical hocus pocus focus here, but what I, what I sensed was, is that uh, life, when we go through life, it's like we're in a rent car. We actually don't own it. We got the bells and whistles, but we're in a rent car. And, and you can look at this earth suit and, and you think, man, this is, this is mine. No, it's not yours. You're in a rental now, you may go to 80, you may go to 90, you may go to 50, and some of you, your rental may go out younger, but we're all in rentals. So, the question is, what are you doing with your rental? The thing that's going to last is the things that you do for God. The things that you do with the rental that He gave you. And I just thought, you know, someday we're going to turn these rentals back in. It may not be in great shape. It may not have many miles left, but we're going to turn these back in. So the question I have as we come to the Lord's table right now, what are you doing with your rental? What are you doing with what God has given you to use while you're on this earth? So I want you to bow your heads and the worship team is going to come and we're going to sing one song before we take the Lord's Supper. But just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm, I want to ask you, are you living in the past? Are you letting a divorce or an abortion or uh, an addiction or wrong choices dictate who you are today? Are you willing to come before the Lord and say, Lord, you've made me a new creation. You've redeemed me. You've forgiven me. You love me. I'm a child of God. That's who you are. And then secondly, do you have a brother or sister that's holding you accountable, giving you courage, giving you encouragement, giving you support, protection, do you have that person? If not, the, the question is, why not? And, and my mom always used to instruct, if you want friends, you've got to be a friend. If you want brothers, you've got to be a brother. And maybe the Lord is wanting you to change some things. You've become way too isolated. You've wandered. So, Father, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, I pray for the next few moments that we will concentrate on what you're doing in us and through us and what you desire from us right now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship.